War. War never changes. Except that's complete and utter bollocks and we all know it. Hello everyone, this is Venom Geek Media here and today I'm going to do a video I didn't plan on doing but because of a recent comment on one of my community posts, I felt like I should do it. Uh, as you will know if you've been following my community posts, Battle of Chintoka, taking a while to make. So the reason I decided to make this video is because I did a community post showing the huge second battle of Chintoka, absolutely gigantic battle. And Geekius Maximus raised some very interesting questions about some of the ships and formations featured. Now, some of these questions I'll answer in the form of shorts, but some of the questions I actually want to go quite in depth into because they're quite interesting and they're somewhat interrelated. This is also, I suppose, a follow up to a video I did a year ago? More than a year ago? Where I talked about the newer ships that would begin appearing in the Dominion War. So, without any further ado, let's get into answering his question. So, the first question that I'm going to answer in this video is given how the mission parameters of battle cruisers like the Parliament are to be aggressive and maneuverable, are Akira's really the best thing to pair them with? Aren't Akira's better suited to hanging back at long range? And actually, I'm going to pair this up with a second question which he asks, which is why in the blazes would you put Vasads with Legates? The Vasad is a monitor, and the Legate is an attack cruiser. Are they specifically meant to be like ambush lines? Like ones that would o operate independently in open space? In a nutshell, yes. Um, but that's not all. What we really get with these two formations, the reason I want to tackle this question together, is because they're kind of attacking the same idea from different angles. And that being, how do we take an existing vessel or an existing role and make it more aggressive. You see, with the Akira, generally it's paired up with Norway's. Lo Norway's have Lance phasers, and so it's very good to pair them up with Akira's. They're, they naturally complement each other. Torpedoes, Lance phasers, all long range. However, that's very predictable, and the exact same can be said for the Vassad. The Vassad is armed with a Lance, and would normally be partnered with the Brinock class torpedo cruiser, again, would be placed in a similar kind of artillery line where they would just stand back and shoot. Now, the problem with that is that it's very predictable. The idea behind having more aggressive support ships, taking what are in essence support vessels like the Vassad and Akira, and making them more aggressive is in making them more unpredictable. Military doctrine is not just about what is most effective, because what is most effective is often quite predictable, because everyone knows that that's what's most effective. Everyone knows that if we put Akira's and Norway's together, we're going to have a very impressive artillery line that can do a lot of damage. But people know that. So it becomes very easy to anticipate what your enemy is going to do and counter what he is doing, by him adopting what is the most efficient course of action. So what that means is that sometimes you need to mix it up. And that is not to say that you just throw away your artillery lines. That is to say that you start adding them in elsewhere to pose the enemy with dilemmas. Yes, I am ripping off M Ryan Macbeth shamelessly. You don't want to pose the enemy with a problem. A problem has a single solution. The enemy has a artillery line, it's causing us heavy damage. Right, well let's try and get around their flanks We're using our attack ships and destroyers, and let's try and disrupt it. Alternatively, if you say have an artillery line, but you also then have Akira's on the flanks, or from the Cardassian perspective, you have a wing of Vassad supported by the legate like cruiser. Well, that raises a dilemma. Where's the main threat actually coming from? We don't know. So, the whole point behind these doctrinal changes is not necessarily to produce something that is necessarily more effective than what has gone before, but to add variations and 
keep the enemy guessing as to exactly what you're planning to do. In terms of getting into the actual detail of what that means, with the Parliament, the Parliament is a battle cruiser. The Akira is a heavy cruiser. In terms of overall speed, they're going to be pretty commensurate. Yes, the Akira benefits a lot from hanging back. It can do a lot more when it's hanging back. It can be a stable torpedo platform and launch its fighters. And this is especially important when what you're pairing it with is a Norway class, which itself is also pretty long range in its design and isn't really well adapted for dealing with close in attacks. Now, by pairing it with a Parliament class, you change up that equation. Now you have something that is more capable at medium and close range. And you also open up an area of tactics that weren't available previously. Now you can start piling in torpedo fire on the enemy flanks. A Parliament and Akira wing is quite difficult to deal with. It's basically similar levels of firepower to a Galaxy wing, except far more mobile. By threatening to put that around the enemy's flank and getting an enfilading fire of torpedoes onto the enemy, yeah, that's quite a big, you know, issue for the enemy and they've got to deal with that. Or set aside resources to potentially counter that. And those are resources that they can't allocate elsewhere. Additionally, there's also a page being taken from Klingon tactics. Some of the viewers will know about the Klingon Chavakal class carrier, which is... How can I best describe it? A hangar bay on wings. Essentially, all the Chavakal is designed to do is fly up to enemy formations. It has very little weapons of its own. Fly up to the enemy formations and then barf, literally barf up its swarm of fighters so that the enemy has absolutely no time to react. Now, again, you can try and preempt that. That's really where the uh, the idea of keeping the enemy guessing is very important. Similar thing with the Leggett and Versad line, or the strike line. Yes, it is designed primarily for ambushes, but it is also intended for use in large-scale battles. The Versad is fairly light, especially compared to the Brinock, but the Brinock doesn't really ever allow the Versad to use its speed, so it's doing the Versad no favours by basically dragging it down. The idea of the strike lines, where you pair the facades up with legates, is to unlock that agility, that mobility of the facades, and again, have that more mobile approach to your uh, support wings, and again, create dilemmas for the enemy, not problems. Something that actually, uh, again, Klingon Doctrine. In Klingon Doctrine, they have, they mix in Katingas into all kinds of different units, including Katinga wings, uh, mixed wings, all things which keep the enemy guessing as to where this kind of heavy firepower is going to be coming from. And when you do that, you inhibit the enemy's ability to make clear decisions. Because all the time that they are thinking about, oh, but maybe it's going to be that thing, or maybe this is going to happen, or maybe they're going to come from there. All the time that the enemy is thinking about the different possibilities, the different ways you might attack, that's not energy he's allocating to responding to you. So you're sapping the initiative by posing dilemmas to the enemy. You take the initiative away from him, and you force him to be more reactive rather than active. The other question I want to quickly address is, he asks, I don't know if pairing interceptors and Mirandas is a good idea. The Mirandas are probably just going to drag behind badly, and I would hate to be the captain of an interceptor who has to constantly slow down to let the Mirandas catch up while travelling at warp. Sabres would probably work better. Yes, absolutely, this is clear. So this kind of feeds into another issue or problem you have, which is the case of doctrine and training. Interceptors being paired up with Mirandas, essentially the idea there is very simply, oh, this is a new attack ship, we'll pile it into existing attack ship units. Now, there are benefits to that. It's very simple to train and drill. Effectively, an attack ship formation with interceptors is going to be used pretty much the same 
as any other attack wing. The primary idea was actually that the Interceptor would replace the Akiazi class, which was being used as a true Federation attack ship because the Defiant was so costly to produce. So they brought back the Akiazi class. That didn't exactly go great, as you can well imagine. But Interceptor now replaces the Akiazi and actually serves as an effective attack ship. Yes, the Interceptor is very fast. And there are formations that will make use of that. You will see Interceptors paired up with ships like the Nova class or the Intrepid class. These very aggressive formations that are again designed for uh, raiding and sort of open campaign. A lot of the early formations in the Nabinian War are just about getting ships into line, into formation. It's about building up that sort of basic building blocks of doctrine. You know, doctrine is a starting off point, not the destination. And that's another important thing, again, going back to the other two formations that I mentioned. While Doctrine does state that, oh, we must pair all our heavy fire power ships together, there's a reason behind that, yes, and it's not an invalid view. But equally, it's only the starting off point. And this is very much the case with the Interceptor. So a lot of Interceptors are being pushed into these formations conforming to existing Doctrine, while some are being used to form new formations. However, there's a real problem, and that is training time. When you create a new formation, you're having to formulate an entirely new set of tactics and doctrine for how it will operate. That's very difficult. Not only do you have to train the crews, you also then need to actually train up and explain the fleet commanders who will be playing with these ships. So, you know, imagine them, imagine these formations as playing pieces. You've got to actually explain to fleet commanders what these things do. Because otherwise, you can get them horribly misallocated. And so, in terms of what Starfleet's doing, they take the view that it's far better to just integrate them into pre-existing formations. We'll set aside some ships that will form the basis of these new formations and that will be trained with officers who know what they're doing but that the majority of fleet commanders can be familiarized with these vessels by folding them into already existing formations and doctrine. Is that the best idea? No. But it's a good way to get those ships into action and get the crews experienced with those ships, rather than having to train up a completely new fleet. I'm sure there are some people in, in high command who like to say, oh, well, I want all of these new ships in my brand new fleet, my first fleet or whatever, and, you know, it's just going to be heads and shoulders better. Well, if you do that, well, number one, that's going to sap morale from people in the older fleets using older vessels. It's going to create more of a divide between your troops, which you really don't want, but also your big grand fleet of brand spanking new ships is going to take far longer to field as opposed to us filtering them into the mainline fleets and slowly but surely changing those fleets into far more modern formations and before you know it, you've got fleets filled with interceptors, intrepids, lunars, prometheus, parliaments, sovereigns. Suddenly you've got all of these ships going into action and, you know, that's really turned the tables. But you didn't have to build up an entire fleet of them, you just steadily filtered them in and allowed commanders to get familiar with the ships while also experimenting with new ideas yourself. I think a good note to end on is compare that kind of doctrinal development to what the Dominion were doing with the joint orders, where, in fact, what was happening was all the new stuff, or pretty much most of the new stuff, was being hoarded by the joint orders and thus created a greater divide which the Dominion wanted. They wanted a divide between the mainline Cardassian fleet and the joint orders but that almost certainly had an effect on Cardassian morale. The fact that they knew that all these nice new ships like the Janissary, like the Legate, like the Sartan were being developed and were being built but they would never see them 
or would never see them in significant numbers because they were constantly getting hogged by the combined orders. You know, these politically chosen few. And of course, that creates a lot of resentment. And that kind of discord can be more dangerous to a military force than any new enemy weapon. So thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I'll have more shorts coming out during the week. And of course, next week, the Battle of Chintoka.